Good morning. In recent entries, I've been talking about my evidence and my study as a big tapestry with um, many, many connections and how I can connect the dots from one part of the tapestry to another. So today we're going to do something that I have done in my written blog, which presumably people believe me when I say that I'm doing things in real time. But what I've done is to randomly select a folder from my database and then randomly select one of Matthew's pieces from that particular folder and analyze it and show how it connects with the other pieces, including some of the famous claims that I've made and how it connects with Matthew's own deep uh, autobiography, his life. So I'm going to do that now. I just this morning figured out how to get my way around this webcam software. So uh, this is a Logitech uh, webcam. I've had it for a while, but I haven't really used it to its full potential. And today I'm going to try to do that. So um, here we're going to go to my database. And you'll see here in the MFW master file folder that I have um, I'm going to have to get my glasses, that we have all of these different publications that Matthew Franklin Whittier wrote for. And if you get, for example, into one of the big ones, like the Boston Carpet Bag, you will see that there's a possible folder. This is the folder in which I put the pieces that I wasn't quite sure were Matthew's work. And um, all the other ones, which is what I used to count the 2,300, I am quite certain that they're Matthew's work by a whole bunch of different criteria. Um, and I've talked about some of the ways that I, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the different ways that I determine a piece as Matthew's. That would take an entirely different entry and probably a good entry, but obviously style. And I look to see if he's repeating any of his old gags or any of his old ideas, which he occasionally would every five, ten years or so. Um, I also look at his travelogues. If the piece in question has an indication of where he is at a, on a particular date, then I look at his other pseudonyms and see where they are on that date. For example, if uh, he writes uh, with some pseudonym I'm not familiar with or not certain about in say the Boston Weekly Museum, or let's say the Portland Transcript, and he gives a date or he gives an event which can be dated, you know, New Year's Day celebration or the 4th of July celebration or any particular uh, performance that I can date. Then I go back to the Boston Weekly Museum and I see what Quails, which I know definitely was his pseudonym and not Ash and Dodge, and I see what Quails was doing on that date. Well, if the pseudonym in question in the Portland transcript says that he was at the 4th of July celebration in Portland, Maine. And then I look at Quails, and he says he was in Vermont on the 4th of July, then I have a problem. So that's another way. And, I, and the other thing that I need to emphasize is that these pseudonyms, Matthew would not always just use a one-off. He would sometimes do these little series, four, five, six, over the course of a year maybe sometimes over the course of a month or two. So you'd have four or five examples of typically of a pseudonym that Matthew had briefly adopted and not just one. So what I would do is look at every single one of the pieces under that pseudonym, like Polonius, for example, or Bertram. And is there any contraindication for Matthew? One contraindication, which we're going to see in a little bit because I've got an example coming in, is cruelty to animals. It was typical in the 19th century to casually be cruel to animals or to think that was funny, believe it or not. Um, and But Matthew did not. He, he was evolved beyond that point, and he didn't think it was funny. And, and unless he really, on, on very rare occasions, he would do it, have a character be cruel to animals if he was really trying to paint a villain. For example, in his story for boys, he has the bully torturing baby birds in the nest, see, and torturing birds in the nest. Well, that wasn't it. Matthew aboard that. But if he really wanted to paint the villain, he, he might, on very rare occasions, have that person do something like that. But um, 
other writers would just casually, you know, have cruelty to animals and think it was funny. If if I ever see that, I'll know that's not Matthew's work. And that's come up a couple times. There's a fake Ethan Spike story, which I know is fake because Matthew said it was, basically, a little bit later on, That's uh, that I bought, a physical copy. It's coming in. And when it gets here, I'll go ahead and go through that with you in real time like I'm doing with this before I've actually read it. At least that's the plan. So here what I'm going to do, it's a little awkward, but I think I can do it, is close my eyes. I'll have a split screen here, uh, which I'll put up now. And I can close my eyes and randomly select. Now, this isn't scientifically random, you know, admittedly, but I'll randomly select one of the folders. And then once I'm in that folder, I, I have to do this in two parts. Otherwise, I'm like blind man's bluff and I'm all over the screen. I don't know where I am. So the second stage, I'm going to close my eyes again and scroll up and down through this particular piece. This just happens to be Gleason's pictorial and click on one and then we'll read it together. So that's the plan. And uh, I think we can do that. So let's, let's see. I won't be looking into the screen all the time because I'm busy looking down at my, my screen. So I apologize for uh, the lack of eye contact on this one. I'll try to remember to glance up at the camera periodically. So uh, with the caveat that I just learned how to do this and in front of the camera, I always get a little bit nervous and forget how to do things. We're going to proceed. I'm going to do five. And uh, you'll see how this works once we get into it. So now I'm going to close my eyes with a split screen. You should be able to see that I'm closing my eyes, hopefully. And I'm going to randomly select, quote unquote randomly, select a folder. I have unfortunately selected one that's only got one example, which I was afraid of doing. You know, but okay, well, we're in here. There's only one example. Let's look at it. This is signed Chapin by the looks of it. It's in a little newspaper called The Gavel. And by style, I felt that this was Matthew Franklin Whittier's work. So I'm going to get into uh, that one. I should be able to put it up on the screen for you. Here it is. Oh, yes, we've talked about this. Well, I hate to make this one of the four, but let's go ahead and talk about it. Let's see. This is the gavel. This is the odd fellows. But really speaking, this is not the full poem. So we can talk about that. The full poem is in the Rose of Sharon, and this is my notes down on the bottom. E.H. Chapin, it's attributed to. Um, this is 1846, April. Um, the Rose of Sharon published it, I believe, in 1842, much earlier. So this fellow named William H. Herbert has gotten hold of this poem, which he attributes to Chapin, possibly on the basis of seeing it in the Rose of Sharon in 1842, and possibly not. Um, and it's been modified. So if he'd gotten it from the Rose of Sharon, he wouldn't have modified it. And it's been modified not just by accident, but intentionally. It's been censored, you know. So where they had the word breast, he's taken that out and put rest and things like that. I've been through this before, so I don't want to go into too much. But this, this is an example of one of Matthew's poems that somehow got attributed to a minister named E.H. Chapin. And if I had the Rose of Sharon up here, I could, I could go into that and show you why. Maybe I will. But uh, the gist of it is that I strongly feel that Matthew wrote this by style. He wrote it in 1839 when Abby was still alive and they were living in Portland because it's very similar in style to one that he wrote during that period under a known pseudonym. It was F, his middle initial. And um, Matthew wrote this. Somehow it got attributed to E.H. Chapin. I'm guessing that he shared it with, Ms. with Reverend Chapin. I don't think that Reverend Chapin claimed it. I think he tried to keep it anonymous, and he somehow or other it got to the Rose of Sharon, and they knew that it had come from Reverend Chapin, and they assumed that it was written by Reverend Chapin. He didn't write anything really like this. See, Matthew did. So they assumed it was written by him. This is the mischief that happens when Matthew keeps so deeply hidden. And, you know, I say nature abhors a vacuum, and rumor abhors a vacuum, and scholarship and academia also abhor a vacuum. When you artificially create a vacuum by hiding to the extent that Matthew did, remaining anonymous and remaining incognito, 
then people fill in the gaps. This happened with Margaret Fuller and the star in the New York Tribune. It happened with the F signed pieces in the dial, which were Matthews and not Margaret Fuller's. It happened with Osh and Dodge uh, and Quails and the Boston Weekly Museum and any number of other situations it happened with the Raven. Matthew could have come out and defended himself at that point and proven, presumably, that he was the author of the Raven. He didn't for many reasons, personal reasons, and also because he was so deeply involved with the Underground Railroad and the abolitionist movement. So uh, this is an example. I don't think E.H. Chapin intended to claim this. I think it was an accident. But by the time it gets here to the gavel, which is the Oddfellows publication in New, in New York, I think, um, it's been distorted. So he couldn't have gotten it from the Rose of Sharon. It's been truncated. I think it's been distorted. Not a lot, but just in certain crucial areas that indicate that the person doing the distorting didn't know what the heck the poem was and didn't understand poetry, you know. So we'll go ahead and leave that one for now, since I've already talked about it before. We'll get back into my database. Let's see, I can get this one off screen. And uh, we'll go back up to the main body of the database. And hopefully when I close my eyes this time, we'll get one of the bigger ones. So here I am again, closing my eyes. And I'm going to double click on a folder. And all I got was the Boston Courier, <laughs> another little one. All right, well, this is a scientific exercise. So in the Boston Courier, see, the Boston Courier was the paper owned by Joseph T. Buckingham in 1820, early 1820s, really all through the 1820s. And Matthew began writing for this paper as a boy of 12, meaning the New England Galaxy, the literary paper that Joseph T. Buckingham owned when, when he was 12 years old in 1825. And uh, I've already talked about how Joseph Buckingham in his memoirs alluded to Matthew calling him Moses Whitney, but giving some very specific identifiers that clearly make it definite that he was Matthew. So here in The Courier, which was also owned by Joseph T. Buckingham, his daily paper, I think Matthew worked for him for a while as a typesetter. And primarily he wrote for the other paper, the New England Galaxy. But I found two pieces that look like they're Matthews. So here is an asterisk, and this is 1829. Now I have often said that Matthew started using the asterisk in 1830. But if this is Matthews, he actually started using it in 1829. So let me get my glasses on here and let's look at this. I haven't looked at this in a long time. It's a letter to the editor. It says, to the editor of The Courier, which would be Joseph T. Buckingham. The pages of yesterday's Gazette sparkled with unwanted brilliancy in a column and a half of the condensed extract of caustic satire alleviated with the soothing cataplasms of fancy and wit. This is Matthew Franklin Whittier's style flat out. Okay. He's talking about somebody else who had a differing opinion. We know not when the hereditary dullness of the paper has been so happily relieved by the excited genius of the editor. Now, this is pretty sarcastic toward the editor, which is a bit surprising. And we are willing to forgive the thrice written and thrice confuted sophistry of its political speculations in consideration of one column of novelty. Oh, he's talking about the Gazette. Okay, so he can be sarcastic about the Gazette. He wouldn't be sarcastic toward the editor of the Courier, so that would be a contraindication. But no, this is a rival paper. I've never gotten into the Gazette, but apparently Matthew and probably Joseph T. Buckingham didn't think very highly of it. So he says, uh, let me go back again. And we are willing to forgive the thrice written and thrice confuted sophistry of its political speculations in consideration of one column of novelty one brilliant and manly effort to strike into a new and untrodden path. Well, first of all, I haven't seen, no, there, I take that back. There's one other uh, person or a couple people that tried to use the star around this same period up in New York. I haven't seen anybody in Boston using the star other than Matthew. And the fact that it sounds so exactly like Matthew's young sarcasm. Keep in mind, this is August 1829. He's 17 years old. 
So this is a 17 year old young man. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, so this has got to be Matthew by style. So let's see, we cannot now enter into a detailed analysis of all the delicious emanations of a fancy so imaginative as his who, quote, wheels the destinies of a whole republic. But having directed the attention of our readers to the leading article in the Boston Gazette, Gazette of yesterday for an unparalleled display of Horatian pungency and elegance, we shall pass on to the concluding paragraph as the only one which we feel disposed to notice with any other mark of observance than silence and perfect contempt. Matthew didn't write with quite this much of an edge in general later on, but at 17, you know, He's brilliant. He's the angry young man. He's extremely sarcastic. And this is Matthew. And, and coupled with the fact that it's a star, this is Matthew Franklin Whittier. And um, it's probably the earliest instance of him signing with this star. So <laughs> at this time, he's 17. Abby would have been 12. She would have been tutoring him. They were not yet a romantic item, but definitely she was tutoring him at this age. And she had no doubt told him about the stars and about her belief in the stars. And so he apparently started using that pseudonym at that point. It's an indication that Matthew, that Abby rather was indeed tutoring him when she was 12 years old. So um, I think that's enough for now. It just gives you an idea. That means, it means that where you see the star that's definitely Matthew, all the way from 1829. You know, I may have serious lags here in my uh, um, in the frame rate, so I apologize if the lip sync is off. Um, my computer is a somewhat old one. It probably can't really handle what I'm trying to do here today, so there's nothing much I can do about fixing uh, the lip sync. Um, it means that the asterisk is definitely Matthew's all the way from 1829 onwards. It means that I have been accurate and correct in identifying Matthew's pseudonyms. When I say he's definitely the asterisk, I mean definitely. I'm not guessing about that. That's not magical thinking. And the asterisk has huge implications for all the other pieces that I talk about, including the famous ones. Now, let's get, uh, excuse me, back into my database. Let's see if I can get something a, a little more populated here. So here I am back into my database. You can see how many different pieces that I've identified Matthew in. And they're obscure and they're big. So we've got Gleason's Pictorial. That's that's a really big paper. Um, Human Rights is just a little one that I found that might have one or two and I'm still not sure of. I think if we go into Human Rights, we'll see I didn't even give it the uh, dignity of a definite. It's all impossible. Um, the Dover Inquirer is fairly big. I've even got Douglas Jarrell's newspaper. There was one Ethan Spike story that I just keyed in this morning that got published overseas in Douglas Jarrell's newspaper. Douglas Jarrell was one of uh, a, a few close friends of Charles Dickens, for those of you that don't know. Um, New England Galaxy, that's the very first one that he ever published in, and so on. So here I am. I'm going to shut my eyes again, which you should be able to see on the screen. And I'm coming down a little bit, and I'm going to double-click on a folder, I hope. What have I gotten? Punch <laughs> with one piece. <laughs> I was joking with myself before I started this. I said, if this doesn't work out, I'll do two out of three <laughs> and, then, and then tell you that I'm joking. Okay, I'm going to launch this thing. In a way, this is not really coming out like I planned. But then again, you never know. Things work out for a reason. Here we are with the only piece that I have definitely identified as Matthews, or by style, in Punch magazine. Okay, this was published in the first half of uh, 1851. I'm not sure exactly which month it was. Um, nothing in Punch is signed, near as I can tell. It's all anonymous, so there's no signature on this. This has to do with something that was topical. It was a, a, a issue at the time, which Matthew could very easily have read about in the papers, the London papers in America. 
in 18, in July, July 2nd of 1851, Matthew, writing as quails for the Boston Weekly Museum, went to Europe to attend the International Peace Congress and also to visit the World's Fair in the Crystal Palace and to tour Europe. And he wrote about that in that travelogue. This is the part that has been mistakenly attributed to Ash and Dodge. In any case, apparently, before he went on his trip, as he was, no doubt, he would have been studying England, see, in, prep, in uh, preparation for his trip. So as he was reading the London papers, he came across this controversy in which the priests at, uh, at St. Paul's Cathedral were charging poor people, like a couple pence, to come inside the cathedral, which was never the architect. Christopher Wren's intention, apparently, and it was a travesty to Matthew in particular. It was a travesty that these people were getting rich, you know, by charging for the poor people to come into St. Paul's. So he either wrote a poem about it or he took an existing poem that he'd written many years earlier and added to it. That's kind of what I think, because this poem is really in two parts. And the first part has to do with making fun of the fact that the statues in St. Paul's Cathedral of historical figures, relatively recent historical figures, are dressed in Roman garb. They're not dressed in normal street clothes. And his premise is that the ghosts of these famous people come back and are horrified to see the way they're dressed in their statues. See, and then they're all there to meet with the, the ghost of the architect, Christopher Wren, who shows up and is very displeased that the poor people are being charged. See, that's the premise of this thing. But I think the first poem started out just with this issue of the, the ghosts of the famous people horrified at the way that they're dressed. Um, and the reason I think that is there's a line in here that triggered a very strong past life hit for me. As soon as I read it, I felt it made Abby giggle. And I thought that was wonderful because I love to make Abby giggle. She was the serious one, the somewhat prudish one. See, she was the Victorian. And, and I was the kind of the raconteur, see, the, the, the satirist. So anytime I could make her laugh, it was well, she had a beautiful laugh anyway, is what I feel. And it was wonderful to get her to laugh, see. So anytime I could loosen her up a little bit. If you've seen Lark Rise to Candleford, the character Fisher, who courts Laura, her first love, says that she's buttoned up. And, you know, it's like that. So this is the poem. I don't know if I can read the whole thing. It's an excellent poem. And I will tell you that it is better in quality than just about anything else that's in Punch, 1851. There's a couple that get close to it, but basically the humorous poems in Punch are sloppy. You know, they're, they're just good enough technically to, you know, to make the commentary, but Matthew writes excellent poetry. Remember, he's the younger brother of John Greenleaf Whittier. He writes excellent poetry. He takes humorous poetry seriously as his, as his primary interest, see? So he, he makes much better humorous poetry as poetry than anybody else in Punch. So that's one indication that it's his. I know that sounds grandiose of me for Matthew, but it's, I, I mean, objectively, I think that's the truth. So anyway, here we go. <clears throat> there's, there's an artist, by the way, who did a drawing of this for me for my first book, Matthew Franklin Whittier in his own words. I don't remember his name. I don't know if I should mention it anyway, even if I did. But he was a contemporary artist who had, who had drawn the very last cover of Punch before it folded. I forget when that was, in the 1980s or something. And uh, he was online for hire, amazingly. I was able to hire him for this. And what I did was I sent him the Ethan Spike speech on white supremacy, as though, you know, Ethan Spike was a white supremacist, and he was talking about the superiority of the Anglo-Saxony race, see? Um, I just sent that to him, and I said, you know, please, you know, draw this character, and he did, and it was absolutely perfect. So later on, I went back, and I asked him, could you illustrate this poem? And uh, we went through a couple more permutations on this one. Eventually, I said, look, just 
have this character, the main character, Samuel Johnson, have him looking directly at the viewer. And he was skeptical about it, but it worked perfectly. It's I'll I'll find it. I say tell you what, after after this is over, I'll find it and put it up on the screens for you so you can see what I'm talking about. Magnificent drawing. But I think he was John Tenniel. John Tenniel was an illustrator, uh, a, a British illustrator, famous one at the time. And he looks very similar. I can't, you know, put this fellow's image on the screen, but he looks very similar to John Tenniel. I feel, looking at John Tenniel, that Matthew must have contacted him or met him when he was writing as quails in Europe in 1851. I think he met him. So, you know, it's possible that Matthew had shown this to him or talked to him about this and said, I, I wish I could get you to illustrate it or something. And that karma carried forward such that I actually asked his reincarnation to do it. And he did. And that closed that piece of karma. That's speculation. But it's speculation with, you know, a little bit of educated guesswork. So anyway, here we have, as the mighty hammer smiting 12 times on the metal falls comes a rush of ghosts alighting in the nave of dim St. Paul's. Make sure you've got it up on the screen. For tonight, the ghosts are gathered of the great that slumber here, ill-used great, on whom are fathered all the marble monsters near. Johnson's ghost is there, disgusted at his naked legs of stone, legs that, save in silk or worsted, ne'er were even to Boswell shown. Howard, with a simple wonder at his dress of sheet and key, thinks they must have made a blunder, ne'er in such attire went he. Chiefs who wore cocked hats and feathers on their tombs themselves behold, stripped e'en to their boots and leathers in their buff like knights of old. That's the one where Abby tittered that I remember. I can feel it. As I'm thinking about it, I can feel it right now. So then he gets down to this business. Well, well Wren's ghost shows up, looming bigger yet and bigger, filling up those vasty walls, not reduced to form or figure. Tis his ghost that built St. Paul's. So that's in the illustration also. And he's just not pleased at all. He thinks he wanted for poor people to be able to come in and forget their poverty and be re religiously uplifted, see. But um, priests and prelates, in your groveling, heedless how you smirch your gowns, into swollen pockets shoveling eagerly the wretched browns, up for shame the world is tripping unto England's labor show, meaning the uh, Crystal Palace. Let it now behold you stooping to such paltry gains and lo. So he spake. The ghosts in chorus straight took up his dying fall and rung out three groans sonorous for the dean and chapter all, and a general vote was passing, just as our reporter left, that the ghosts would quit en masse in case they still kept up the theft. That is Matthew Franklin Whittier, quintessential, and it's one of his best. That's every bit as good as The Raven. <laughs> okay, this is why I say it's like, it's like the raven was no no big deal to him in terms of quality, you know. <laughs> so uh, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, it's, you know, quality is in the eye of the beholder, but that is an excellent humorous poem from someone that, that studied this field from childhood. This is what Matthew wanted to be, you know, was a, a satirical uh, writer, satirical author. And he has come home to... Uh, uh, he's come home to Europe with better work than they're putting out. <laughs> um, so that was Punch. What is that? The second one we've done? I wanted to do five. I can't remember if we've done two or three. So once again, I am going to scroll through these guys and click on one. This time, if I don't get one that's got a lot in it, I think I'll move on. All right. We got the Boston Weekly Museum. We're good to go. So now I'm going to scroll through these and click on one randomly. Hopefully I got one. Nope, I didn't. I was outside the pale there. All right, here we go. We're trying again. Okay, looks like we did get one this time. I have it up on my screen. We're going to, uh, first of all, I've got to get rid of the punch one. 
I'm going to bring this up on the screen here. And there we are. Now, this is a travelogue in the Boston Weekly Museum, which comes in. I've got, I've got something I added to it with notes. It's signed ABD. And this comes in pretty close to the same time that quails launched. So what it means is that Matthew had at least two, and I think more, travelogues running concurrently. Now, when I was writing my book and I found this, I already knew that quails was Matthew Franklin Whittier. And I found this ABD and a few others. There's one named Viator that I thought might be Matthew's, but Viator hunts. Matthew would not have been hunting, so therefore I crossed Viator off the list. But when I got to ABD, I saw him writing in dialect, describing a military muster in the same kind of dialect style that Matthew used. So either it had to be an imitator, because Matthew launched that style back in 1825, uh, and had just started Ethan Spike three years earlier in, in 46. So it either was a, a pretty good imitator, a very good imitator. Most of them weren't that good. Or else it was Matthew. It was like he'd signed it. And yet, ABD, at one point, I don't, it might be this one. And he ends up talking about how he went to school in Stevens Plains in Westbrook. Now, Westbrook is where I'm, it, where I'm sitting now used to be Westbrook in Matthew's day. So now it's Portland, but it was Westbrook. And Stevens Plains is that way, about a five minutes drive or less. I could walk to it very easily. You know, the, the place that he went to school would have been within a five minute drive of here, very near Evergreen Cemetery. If you saw my uh, little documentary, mini documentary about Evergreen Cemetery, it's right there in that area. So here he is in Moral House. Now, Moral House, I've got a picture of that thing down here at the bottom. That's what Moral House looked like. And um, there's a Moral Avenue, I think it is here, not far away. I know I can basically drive right past this. And again, about five minutes drive, I can drive right past this thing. It's not there anymore. Um, Matthew also wrote during roughly this period as B the initial B. And I'm trying to remember, I think it was for this same newspaper uh, in 49, because at the end of 49, B talks about having seen Poe recite in Boston in 1845. So he's writing as B. B lives in Westbrook. ABD here is visiting Westbrook. And ABD, I think, stands for all but degree. And I didn't get this when I was writing my book, but what it means is Matthew has got everything but the degree <laughs> in terms of his education. I think that's what it means. So here he's staying at the Morrill House in Westbrook, which was not very far from here. And let me get my glasses on again and see what he writes about. Uh, I'll give you an, an idea of his style. My peregrinations have at last led me to the quiet and beautiful vicinity of Stevens Plains amidst associations of early schoolboy days. Well, Matthew did not go to school in Stevens Plains. So either this is not Matthew, or it is Matthew deliberately throwing in a red herring. I believe that's the correct term. He's throwing in something that will throw everybody off. And remember, he is using these columns to report, I think, to William Lloyd Garrison, reporting his contacts and his whereabouts. So the reason that he runs several of these things concurrently is that he can totally confuse the people who are trying to track him down. And to further confuse them, he occasionally lies about his own personal history. Not often. Just every once in a blue moon, he will throw in some reference to his past that is not correct for Matthew. These things gave me a huge headache. Okay? But there's so many indicators pointing to Matthew. He also writes as Down East. So he's got Down East going, he's got ABD going, Quails, and B. All of these things are running concurrently. And then, eventually, some of these he hands off to somebody else. And suddenly they become a different person that doesn't match Matthew at all, whereas the first half matched him perfectly. Now, 
if you take the itineraries of all of these guys, what you find is that under one pseudonym, he records this part of the trip. And under the other pseudonym, he records another part of the trip. Like, for example, let's say he's going from Boston to New York. And uh, Quails will give you his itinerary all the way from Boston to New York. But one of the other ones, uh, B, for example, or B doesn't really leave home that much, but let's say ABD talks about being in Portland, you know, well, or the star might write in Portland or Ethan Spike might write in Portland. Well, if you look at the itinerary for quails, I hope I'm not boring anybody, but I mean, this is what I had to go through to establish these things as Matthews. I did not pull them out of my head. So look at the itinerary for quails. There's a gap of about five or six days right at the time when ABD is in Portland or the star is in Portland. See, so Portland was where his family was. He did not want these anti or rather pro-slavery people who were probably making death threats to the editors sometimes. He certainly did not want them to know where his family was, where his unprotected family and his children were, see. So he would take Portland completely out of Quails' itinerary and put it in one of the other ones. <laughs> it's very interesting stuff. So here ABD is in Westbrook in the vicinity of Stevens Plains, right practically exactly where I am. But how changed is all around in the brief interval of seven years. So he's making of himself somebody that went to school seven years earlier. See, well, Quails is an old man. Another one of Matthew's travelogues for the uh, transcript actually changed identities from 56 to 57. Started out as a student going out on a, on a holiday excursion to get away from studies. And then the next year, he's a family man with, with a, a wife and a family that he's moving from rural Maine to Detroit. <laughs> so, you know, this is the little, little uh, games that Matthew plays. So he talks about changes written on every feature of, na of nature in mystic yet indelible characters. Well, Matthew is a mystic and a philosopher, and he'll throw in little bits and pieces of philosophy and mysticism. See, just casually, like the, the Lethean stream he'll just throw in or something like that. Now, the region about Portland, unlike the vicinity of Boston, wears quite a country-like appearance and presents scenes of rare beauty and great variety. The city itself has a kind of village-like appearance, comparatively speaking, which enhances its pleasantness, and its numerous shade trees justly entitle it to the appellation of the City of the Elms. Well, it still has a little bit of that character, relatively speaking. Uh, my neighborhood here is beautiful, old Victorian houses. There's trees up and down the, uh, the streets, you know. I've got one right out here. Westbrook, like Portland was taken from the loins of old Falmouth, but the children have wonderfully outgrown the parent and all the improvements that render towns prosperous and beautiful. It is a fine town with many excellent farms and delightful residences, embracing in its precincts three villages, Stroudwater with its shipping and commercial trade, Sacarapa with its cotton manufactories, and Stevens Plains, to which may be added Woodford's Corner with their tin and Britannia ware shops, etc., etc., that's there. I'm <laughs> pointing in that direction. It's there. I, I, can, I can look out my window, and, and if I could look far enough, crane my head far enough to the left, I would be looking at Woodford's Corner. Okay? I don't want to give away my location, but basically it's half a block's walk to Woodford's Corner. So this was written here. <laughs> um, and he goes on. Let's see if there's any other indications here talks about, there's more about his supposed past. Now, let's, let's look at a little bit of philosophy that he throws in. To look back, to view the emotions, the idea of hopes of early years, and compare them with the cold realities that all find in their stead. And it sounds like an older man. This doesn't sound like somebody that just went to school seven years ago. To realize that our bright dreams of the future were only dreams is indeed a sad reflection. Yet such is life. Bright and glorious is the morning and a thousand beauteous tints seem to shadow forth a splendid noon. But dark clouds arise in the clearest skies amid the day that dawns so gloriously is made up of alternate, that's a typo on my part, sunshine and the darkest gloom. Quote, Blessed are they who expect but little, 
for they will not see disappointment. Now, I've told you that Matthew was a Stoic philosopher, okay? So you're seeing that now. For what an insignificant might compared with our youthful anticipations in the realization of earthly joys, faded are a thousand hopes, fallen many a bright scheme. Such are the reflections suggested upon visiting Stephen's Plains, but no less true when applied to other places. Such is life, such is destiny. Now, you may recognize this writer in the poem that I just read you in my previous entry and the star-signed essay on Utopia that I also read at the end of that entry. So there's no question, ABD is Matthew Franklin Whittier, okay? When you put that plus the Ethan Spike sounding satire on musters and everything else together. So this is me back in 1849 writing about the same place that I'm in now, the place that's half a block down the street. <laughs> I think that's interesting, you know? I don't know if anybody else thinks that's interesting. Again, if people believed me, I think they would think it was interesting. So what have I got? Two more? Let's do two more of these. So we'll get out of the weekly museum and let's see what else we come up with. I hope this is interesting to someone. It's going to run a little long, but, you know, I did not plan this out. This really is randomized in a rough, unscientific sort of way. Now, we are in the New York Inquirer. So this is a very early paper. Matthew launched the genre of Yankee dialect in this paper with Joe Strickland. Joe Strickland was not written by George W. Arnold, which one scholar had assumed. Uh, that was a lottery shop owner. These were not really puffs or advertisements for his shop. These were written by a real runaway, a brilliant runaway, who had been denied a college education, who had been told that if he went to the big city, he would be corrupted and he would fall prey to the gambling and the lottery and he'd be ruined. So he is right at, so what he's doing is sarcastically writing back to his family to tell him he's okay in the character of an ignorant country bumpkin from Vermont who has struck it rich very easily with the lottery. <laughs> Every time he plays the lottery, he wins. See, this ignorant fellow. So he's teasing his family with this. But they're auto as all Matthew's work is, this is autobiographical. It's just disguised autobiography. Now, I am going to close my eyes and randomly pick. They're all with the exception of one that's signed Franklin, we should look at that because that's Matthew's middle name. So we're going to look at Franklin and then we'll go back and randomly pick one of the Joe Strickland ones. So here, hopefully my computer will be able to handle this. There we are. This is signed Franklin. This is what Matthew, Matthew Franklin Whittier, signing with his middle name. This, I think, is the first instance of him signing with his middle name. He would do it many times later and also sign with his middle initial, as he did in the first two years of the dial, which was not Margaret Fuller. So as he did writing in 1831 in praise of Francis Quarles, which is the pseudonym that Matthew used when he submitted The Raven to American Review. <laughs> so there are some tie-ins here. Okay, so this is the New York Inquirer. Mordecai Noah is the editor of this paper. And uh, actually, this is not the first one because Mordecai Noah was editing the New York National Advocate. And then he left the Advocate and launched his own paper, the Inquirer. So these are not the very first ones, but he's still writing for Mordecai Noah. But here, this is not Joe Strickland. This is Matthew telling us what he really thinks about gambling not sarcastically and satirically in Joe Strickland or as Joe Strickland. So first off, he starts out, this is the third one. It's the only one I found. I couldn't access the whole paper. Um, he starts out with a quote, which Matthew very often did. Vice is a monster of so foul a mean as to be hated needs but to be seen. I don't know what that's from. I don't know if that's Shakespeare. At this early age, it's the ones that Matthew was familiar with at this time, probably Shakespeare or Byron, 
you know, or the two that he largely quoted from. So um, I'm just guessing off the top of my head, it might be one of those two, but I will put it up on the screen after I finish editing this and we'll see what it is. It has been so much the custom among a certain class of men who imagine themselves to be sole proprietors of all the sanctitude and virtue left for this degenerate age. This is young Matthew, believe it or not. He, at this, at this point, this is just before his birthday. His birthday is July 18, um, and this is 27, so he is 14 years old, going on 15. <laughs> Listen to the language, and I'm not, I'm not wrong about this. This is a 15-year-old boy, but this is the 15-year-old younger brother of John Greenleaf Whittier. They were both geniuses. Both, I guess they were both child prodigies, one would say. It has been so much the custom among a certain class of men who imagine themselves to be sole proprietors of all the sanctitude and virtue left for this degenerate age to rail against imaginary evils that the really moral part of community, tired of their false alarms, have sometimes suffered gross vices to escape their, quote, corrective rod. Remember, this is a Quaker now. He ran away from home, and he's kind of the bad boy of the Whittier family, but he's still... Quaker. Preventives had been devised for evils of a minor description, while some of far greater importance have almost entirely escaped notice. Among the latter, in this city, he's in New York, is the vice to which we would draw the attention of the public. While societies have been established, sermons preached, and essays written for the suppression of intemperance in drinking, the vice of gambling has progressed unmolested. One cause of this seeming inconsistency is easy to explain. The effects of drinking to excess cannot long be concealed from public view, while gaming leads its deluded followers on in secrecy. I've got S-I-C, it's misspelled, misspelled by our lights today anyway. From the world, forces them to become dissemblers, teaches them to wear a smile even when a prey to the most excruciating anguish of mind, and its evil results, like the eruptions of a volcano, burst forth sudden and unexpected, often involving in ruin both the innocent and the guilty. So this is what Matthew, the Quaker, the runaway from home, really feels about gambling. And there's, a, there's an interesting insight here. I mean, this guy is smart. I have the same higher mind he had. When you're talking about an old soul, you know, the higher mind kicks in early and this person, this is a full-blown adult, basically, at the level of the higher mind, even though he's, his body is 15 years old. So what he said is <coughs> that people have overreacted to overblown sanctity. You know, the public has overreacted to the sermons and the uh, moral uh, overblown protestations, you know, of, of the clergy and, and the upright, and they've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. In other words, they've said the heck with all this moralizing, and they've started ridiculing it. Well, in the process, like I said, they've, they've lowered their guard to things that are real dangers. That's what Matthew was saying, and that's a pretty sophisticated observation for a 15-year-old. So he goes on about that. We're not going to continue with that. So what I want to do is to look at some of these Joe Strickland's and um, these are very sophisticated. I showed you the Henrietta Huckabuck, I think, the last entry. Um, well, these are very sophisticated. I'm going to randomly choose one with my eyes closed. Did I get one? I may not have. Let's try again. Oh, I'm trying to I'm trying to click in the in the uh, software. That's not going to work. All right, let's try it. Let's try it in the real Explorer now. There we are, and I'll show it to you on the screen, and then bring it up where I can see it. Hopefully, I think I think you'll be able to see these in a full size screen. They look kind of small here in my window, but okay. This is from an article by Alan Walker Reed, and I've given the uh, citation up here. He is the fellow who automatically assumed that it had to be George W. Arnold, the lottery shop owner. And he went on 
jamming the round peg into the square hole to make that fit, even when the character, Joe Strickland, becomes a runaway and his parents are after him. <laughs> I mean, Occam's Razor says this is Matthew Franklin Whittier, the real runaway who's just disguising his own self a little bit, see? You have to really stand on your head to make George W. Arnold suddenly turn into a runaway. <laughs> so, you know, bless his heart, I mean, he brought this thing to the public and he preserved a whole bunch of these pieces. So that's where I got this is from his article. This is from the New York Inquirer. Again, this is the August 13, 1827 edition. Note that it got reprinted in the New England Galaxy. There's a reason for that. That wasn't just random. That's because that's the other editor who was mentoring Matthew in Boston. That was his friend and mentor, Joseph T. Buckingham, whom he had first started working for and writing for. So it's no accident that Joseph T. Buckingham is reprinting Matthew's work for Mordecai Noah. All right. So he says, in Tother Bull's Head, the bull apparently he, he puts up at the bull's head, and he says, August 10, and it's 1827, Deer, now you will see in Ethan Spike that he also uses deer. In fact, in the one that I just mentioned that he wrote for Douglas Gerald and Douglas Gerald's newspaper, he starts out dear Mr. Gerald, you know. So he used that misspelling, that deliberate misspelling, all the way back to age like 13 or whatever. Dear undutiful Uncle Ben, he's writing his Uncle Ben. Now, he, he had a real uncle, Moses, if I remember correctly. Uh, so he's writing to his uncle. See? Now, now, this is very, this style is very thick in the misspellings and the malapropisms. Uh, I mean, it's so thick you almost can't read it. I think people nowadays wouldn't even try to get through this. It's so difficult. Make sure I have it up on the screen so you can see it yourself. If you want to pause, you know, you can read this. I'm going to read a little bit of it. I mean, he adopted a slightly easier reading style when he created his next characters. Enoch Timbertoes was, I think, his next one, which was 1831. And that one is not quite so difficult to read. But every once in a while, Matthew would come back to this style. And he did it when he protested the critics in their reaction to his anonymous uh, novel, his 1850 novel, The Mistake of a Lifetime. The Mistake of a Lifetime, he had, sought, he had signed Waldo Howard, which was a one-off pseudonym. Uh, but when he wrote about it, he went back to this Joe Strickland st style protesting the uh, critics acting really like he was really stupid, in other words, just like Joe Strickland does. And he signed it uh, Wal Waldo Blowhard instead of Waldo Howard. I'm dyslexic, so I had to stop for a minute. Um, it's obviously Matthew Franklin Whittier returning to his old Joe Strickland style. That way we know that The Mistake of a Lifetime was definitely written by Matthew Franklin Whittier. That's a little smoking gun, but there's a million style indications and otherwise that that was Matthew's novel. It's a good novel. <coughs> so here he says, I was going, here, I got to get some water. <clears throat> I was going to write you when Square Pettibone, Squire Pettibone, went back, but I just having a kind of a scrape, and I hadn't scarcely, scarcely, got over it when he went away. So now I'll tell you something about it. There's a darn passel of folks here in York, New York, that call themselves good society. Some of them are as rich as mud. And some of them, once they just make believe, I guess, only they just make believe, I guess, but there are all darn big bugs and pretty much all humbugs. There's humbug, one of Matthew's favorite phrases he used in A Christmas Carol. And they won't, they won't speak, they won't speak to common folks. Some of them wear big whiskers and yaller spectacles and comb their hair up on their heads and comb their hair up on their heads so to look big. And they talk about 
General Jackson and Quincy Adams, just as if they weren't nobody. They won't let nobody come to their club, only just them that's got money. And one of them, I, I put it in brackets, who knew that Arnold had stuffed me pretty darn full of chemicals, meaning he won the lottery easily, <clears throat> asked me to go and meet with him. So I kind of put on my, I don't know what roast meats or roast meats, roast meats, okay, and went with him. He told him that I was Mr. Joe Strickland from Vermont and had got darn rich at Arnold's. See, there really was apparently an Arnold's lottery. George W. Arnold's lottery, but he wasn't writing this as a puff. That was that was a speculation by Joseph T. Buckingham when he first got hold of one, I think, and he was just mistaken. He didn't recognize Matthew in it. Anyway, it goes on like that. You can see the Quaker. You know, this is a Quaker runaway who still retains Quaker values and has little use for high society or money, either one. Um who is lampooning the high society of New York City. Only he's, according to this particular little plot here, he's been invited to meet them because he won all this money in the lottery from George W. Arnold's lottery shop. See? <laughs> the very first one of these has Joe Strickland standing outside the lottery shop watching a perpetual motion machine for two hours. Matthew was fascinated by science, and he was brilliant. And it's Matthew Franklin Whittier, the 12-year-old runaway, or 14, he might have been at this point, who's fascinated by the perpetual motion machine. Matthew was fascinated by and wrote about technology all his life. See, so Joseph T. Buckingham just simply made a mistake thinking that it was a puff or advertisement, you know, and that the character of Joe Strickland was entirely made up. No, he wasn't made up at all. He was like a photograph put into Photoshop with the filters applied. It was Matthew, autobiographic, you know, speaking of himself, but taking on the cloak of this ignorant boy from Vermont who writes in this horrible writing. But it takes, again, this is... Um, like Victor Borgia, this is not easy to write like this. You have to be pretty smart at age 12 or 13 to do, to do this. You know, it's not everybody that can sit down and write in this style. And he's consistent with these misspellings, you know, and they, they, they're meaningful. At least some of them are. I don't know if, if he started out with that. I think he gradually introduced more and more examples of, uh, of, malapropisms that were meaningful. I'm looking for any of them here. A great many, G-R-A-T-E, um, and Dear Sir, Soldiers, S-O-G-E-R-S. So some of them are, I think, most of them, I think, at this early stage are not meaningful. They're just, he's just trying to make it as awful as he possibly can. But uh, if you take the time to read them, they're actually pretty funny. I mean, this is this is pretty good stuff. Well, anyway, let's see. I don't know how many I did now. I think that's it. Should we do one more? You know, here's the deal. If uh, if people are getting bored, they can always click out. You know, no big deal. Let's do one more. So, in my database now. And I really do have over 2,300. I don't just throw that figure out there to impress people. I'm not lying about it. I really do have. I've counted them. <clears throat> and there are over 2,300. All right. So I'm going to come down a little bit. I'm going to click on what I hope is a folder. And I got the New York Evening Mirror. Now, I've mentioned Pinto. Instead of randomly selecting in this little tiny thing, First of all, Philanthropos, that's a character that Ma Matthew brought back in the carpet bag. And then Pinto, that's another character that Matthew brought back in the carpet bag. And then we have the star. Well, let's look at these. <coughs> let's see what the star is doing, because we know that's Matthew Franklin Whittier. All right, first of all, this is the New York Evening Mirror, which, remember, Edgar Allan Poe, a couple years ago, had been writing for as a critic. 
This is the October 22nd, 1847 edition. Now, Matthew obviously didn't write very much for the Evening Mirror, but he was, let's see, was he in there? No, he wasn't in, uh, he wasn't in New York in October 22nd that I know of. He may have gone up there in October. So this is about the Columbian Magazine. And what I recall, we'll look at it in a minute. I think Matthew wrote a little bit for the Columbian Magazine. And we'll go back and look at that. These are possibles. But I'm pretty sure he wrote two or three articles for the Columbian, including one about Benjamin Franklin, who was his namesake and whom he very much admired. So here he's reviewing the Columbian magazine. The November number of this, the most popular of the $3 monthlies, opens with three very praiseworthy steel engravings, all fine designs, well executed, although the last is, upon the whole, the best of the three. It is intended as a fashion plate, as an illustration of ladies' writing costume for the month, but is, in fact, a well-drawn and well-grouped picture, embracing a lady, a gentleman, and a horse. This, I've looked at this, it's as he describes it. The schoolmaster returning home is perhaps intended as a sly hit at the well-known schoolmaster who has been so long abroad. Now, Matthew has mentioned this a couple times. That's kind of a long issue. There's the, the schoolmaster abroad that goes back to a statement that was made by a member of the, uh, I think it was the House of Commons or the Parliament in England, where he said that uh, he was trying to make the point that... Um, Education was more important than the military, that if you really wanted to influence foreign, foreign affairs, you should send educators abroad and not just soldiers. But he said uh, something to the effect that uh, there's one far greater, you know, than the soldier. The schoolmaster is abroad. Well, all of the people that were listening to this speech had been beaten by schoolmasters, and they feared schoolmasters far more than they feared any soldier. So it amused them and Matthew terribly to imagine that instead of sending soldiers, they were sending schoolmasters, you know. <laughs> so it became a, a, a joke, So and a good joke, too, for, for that period of time. Anyway, so he's referencing that here. It's not the only time he's referenced it. Quote, the little hero, which stands number one in the series, is a popular subject, a boy protecting his little brothers from a wolf. The contributors are, in general, by such authors as Mrs. Osgood, Poe also knew her, whose vein of graceful pathos seems inexhaustible. Well, that's a little bit of a hit at her. Mrs. C.H. Butler, I'm not familiar with, Mr. Sloman, Miss Russell, John Inman, Reverend J.N. Danforth, T.S. Arthur, who wrote kind of very moralistic stories, and William Wallace. The critical notices are, as usual, racy, which doesn't isn't a negative thing in that time, just means fun, and judicious, although brief, and that's a star. This is a brief review written in New York City, apparently, for the New York Evening Mirror. It's the same author who wrote as the star during 1844-1846, which scholars have mistakenly thought was Margaret Fuller. This is Matthew Starr going all the way back now we see to 1829. Okay, this is 1847. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Margaret Fuller was in Europe, now functioning as the European correspondent for the New York Tribune, and she had appropriated that signature and was writing as the star from Europe for the Tribune. But here, the real star is writing a review for the New York Evening Mirror with that same signature. This should be a big red flag for people. <laughs> this is not Margaret Fuller. So I have a little note there. So that's, um, that is the asterisk in the Evening Mirror. Now let's kind of choose one of the other ones. Let's look at Pinto, because I've mentioned Pinto. Now, the real Pinto was a Portuguese, I think, or Spanish explorer who wrote, 
he wrote wild stories about his adventures that apparently people pretty much decided were bogus, okay, made up, BS. So when he takes on this character, which he did in the Boston carpet bag later on, Ferdinand Mendez Pinto, he is bullshitting. And what, he, what this is, is a parody of people in the United States who would read the news and then put it together in a column pretending to actually be writing from overseas. And Matthew could see through them. And he is uh, writing a parody of those people to outdo them all. So Pinto is really not in Europe, <laughs> but he's pretending to be in Rome. See, so that's what this whole thing is about. Now, when Edgar Allan Poe put out his poem, A Valentine, which was a uh, coded poem, and the very same day it came out in the flag of our union, in the Portland transcript, Matthew easily decoded it. Uh, the poem has a reference to Pinto. I think it's a hidden message to Matthew because, as I've said, what he did was he took an earlier poem and then he tacked on this reference to Pinto, these references that would, would be messages to Matthew on top of the poem that he'd written some years before, whatever it was. All right, so <clears throat> this is the introduction. Apparently it's the second one. We are happy to present, this is by the editor, the following interesting letter to our readers, which we received by the last arrival from our highly valued correspondent. Now, whether the editor is in on the joke or not, I'm not sure. He may not be. He may literally think that this is a correspondent from Europe. It will serve as an answer to the many anxious inquiries that have been addressed us from different parts of the country respecting Mr. Pinto's present whereabout. He is still in Italy, where he upholds the honor of his country under all circumstances with the same noble feeling of patriotism which he has displayed since he went abroad. So again, either the editor is in on it and he's writing with his tongue in his cheek or he literally doesn't know. I think maybe he is writing tongue in cheek, but it's kind of hard to tell. So supposedly this is in Rome, October 1st, 1847. My dear F, let's see, this is going to be, I can't read all of this, but I want to get to something that's obviously BS. A former correspondent of the mayor gave you his first impression of Rome and a pretty good description of some of the ruins which are to be seen here, but I shall not take the trouble to do anything of the sort. He means one of the imitators, one of the people that's, per, one of the scammers who's pretending to be in Europe, if I'm not mistaken. I send you a half dozen of volumes in which you will find everything set down that is worth knowing respecting the decayed part of the Eternal City. What he means is that guy got it all from volumes that anybody could have read. That's code. And if you should think your readers are in want of any information on su such subjects, you can occasionally give them a page or two of authentic details. So anybody could write that, in other words. As to the present population of Rome, I think that New Yorkers must be tolerable, tolerably familiar with their personal appearance. For every American artist that comes here sends home a dozen or two of portraits of the beggars in the character of apostles or Virgin Marys. A sturdy old fellow who blacks my boots tells me that he has been painted 28 times in the character of St. Paul, 13 times as Joseph, 9 times as St. Peter, and he cannot remember how many times as, quote, as the, quote, Roman father, and as, quote, the head of an old man, at least a thousand times. This is Matthew's humor. Typical. One would think that from assuming these pious characters so often, he would have attained to uncommon sanctity, but he is, in truth, the greatest rogue I have ever seen in Italy. So Matthew loved to poke holes in pretense. When I accused him of his rogueries and told him what a scandal it was that a man who personated so many saints should be so little like them, he had the impudence to say to me, Why not, Signor? How can I afford to be honest when I only get 10 cents an hour for sitting as a saint? If I got as good pay as the Padres do for acting the saint, see, it's exactly the same person that wrote that poem for Punch. I could afford to be as good as they are, and that would be nothing to boast of, Signor. I think I am a very good saint for the pay. This is typical Matthew Franklin Whittier. Now, let me get down a little bit. He now, because the real Pinto, the historical Pinto, was a huge braggart. 
So he's now going to brag about his personal connection with the Pope and how he disses the Pope. <laughs> but such trifles as these are hardly worth sending all the way from Rome to New York. You will be better pleased to learn something about the Pope, who is the only object now in Rome worth a moment's consideration. I have already informed you that His Holiness had invited me to dine with him at the Vatican. The day on which I was to realize this great honor happened to be the festival of St. Onofrio, the Egyptian, and as there was to be some public rejoicings in the evening, it was necessary that the Pope should be free from any engagements before the illuminations commenced, because he was to bless the candles. Therefore, I was instructed to be in readiness at an early hour in the afternoon. It was just half past two when the scarlet-wheeled carriage of Cardinal Gizzi, I guess that's how you pronounce it, stopped at my plaza. The Cardinal had gone to the Vatican some hours before, he having some private business to transact with the Pope. So I had to ride alone to the papal residence, and I must acknowledge that I felt somewhat flurried at the thought of dining with such a host, and the thought occurred to me, as I am prone to make mal Malapropos, malapropos speech, that if there should happen to be a roast goose on the table, I should infallibly ask for the Pope's nose. This is definitely Matthew Franklin Whittier. And then a far more disagreeable thought occurred to me. The chances were 10 to 1 that I should be poisoned, for I knew that the Austrians, the Neapolitan minister, the representative of the Duke of Lucca, and the ambassador from the king of Sardinia had all threatened to take the life of the Pope and that there had been repeated attempts to poison his food. I might have saved myself any fears on this score for there was nothing on the dinner table but boiled eggs and a pitcher of clear water. I had to pass through several long galleries in the Vatican which were lined with Swiss soldiers before I reached the private apartments of the pontiff. I found him in a small octagon saloon which was furnished very simply and without any picture, although the walls were painted in fresco by Andrea del Sarto, the subject being some rather equivocal story from the pagan mythology, executed by the order of Caesar Borgia when his father occupied the papal chair. The only person, I don't know how much of this is historically accurate, but I'm guessing a lot of it is BS. The only person with his holiness was the Cardinals Gizzi and Lambuccini, Lambuccino, or Lambuccini, I may have mistyped it, the latter whispered in my ear when I entered, Remember, when Pius comes into his private rooms, he leaves his holiness at the door. I understood this as a hint not to address him by that dignified title, and not knowing exactly what to do, that should be what to do, I'm going to have to reproof this, I called him Mr. Pius, but I observed afterwards that the cardinals called him Papa, so I corrected my mistake and did the same. He received me with great cordiality, and soon after I entered, we sat down to dinner. The plainness of the repast surprised me, for I had anticipated some Roman punch at the very least. However, I did not forget that I was in Rome, and of course I expected to do as Romans do. But when Pius remarked that the dinner was a plain one, I could not help replying that in my own country I thanked heaven that under our glorious institutions, freedom of speech and conscience were enjoyed by every member of the community, and that there a man might be virtuously great without being danger without being in danger of eating poison with his food. I guess I need to keep reading a little bit. Let's see. Pius looked a little surprised at this remark, and turning to Cardinal Lambuscini, he said, My son, how shamefully I have been imposed upon by travelers from America who have told me stories about the Bostonians setting fire to a convent of poor nuns and destroying their property and periling their precious lives on account of their religious faith because Catholics were persecuted in America. The Cardinal merely shrugged his shoulders and said, Non me recordo. I don't know what that means. I fear out of politeness to me, for I think he must have I think he must have noticed the scarlet blushes in my face, but as I have adopted for my motto the noble sentiment of my brave countrymen, quote, my country, may she always be right, but right or wrong, my country. Now this is something Ethan Spike used to say, my country, right or wrong. <laughs> um, and I believe you will see a similar little line in a Christmas carol. <laughs> so uh, there's now I'm finally managing to make some connections to the famous ones. Anyway, he goes on and on about his uh, his close, uh, uh, there's another typo, his close 
relationship to the Pope and his rather offhand uh, comments. And uh, apparently uh, Pinto gets huffy about uh, America and, and leaves or something. <laughs> uh, anyway, <coughs> that gives you an idea of Matthew Franklin Whittier. In that case, writing uh, for the New York Evening Mirror. Um, I don't remember what Philanthropos was. We could look at it real quick and then I should sign off here because this was another character that showed up in the carpet bag, which actually was Matthew. It's sometimes written for Matthew and by Shillaber and sometimes written by him. Um, but it's a caricature of Matthew's uh, soft-heartedness, you know, as a bleeding heart in Shillaber's eyes. So this is uh, the health of the city. And this is written for the New York Evening Mirror, obviously about New York. This is real quick. So it has long been known to the medical men in this city that a great portion of its dyspeptic patients in this city suffer in consequence of eating bread made from superfine flour. Now, uh, Matthew suffered from dyspepsia. So this is kind of an autobiographical piece. And he would adopt certain theories of health, some of which were not too far off, some of which probably were off. And here, apparently, he has adopted the uh, theory that refined flour isn't good for you. Well, you'll find a number of people saying that today, that refined flour is bad for you. So here he says, <clears throat> suffer in consequence of eating bread made from superfine flour, which is not health, half so healthy, probably that's a typo, as coarse flour in bran bread. If the families in this city were to substitute the coarse flour for the fine, they would have less use for the apothecary and the doctor and save 33% on the expenditure. The common council ought to know that coarse flour makes more healthy bread than fine. Yet we are told that the 5,000 persons in our almshouse and other institutions on Blackwell's Island are regularly supplied with superfine flour. We should like to know whether this rumor be true. We hardly believe it yet we are assured it is a fact, Philanthropos. So Matthew started with Philanthropos as a serious pseudonym, apparently. And then four years later in the carpet bag, it becomes a caricature of him because Benjamin Penhallow Shillaber, the one that thought it was humorous in his stories to abuse animals, thought that Matthew went way overboard in his concern for people and animals. So uh, that's another tie in here. Well, I think that's enough. Um, I'll get over to my single screen. Uh, you get the idea. I, I know this database backwards and forwards. Obviously, I haven't proofread it backwards and forwards as well as I should have. <clears throat> I keep finding typos. It's, it's been proofread, but obviously I've made a lot of mistakes, missed a lot of things. I can take anything <clears throat> in this database of 2,300 of Matthew's works, which is searchable. And I can show all the interconnections. And many of those connections lead back, at least in, in a minor way, if not a major one, to the major claims that I have made concerning A Christmas Carol and The Raven and Margaret Fuller's work and the poems plagiarized from Matthew by Elizabeth Barrett Browning it all ties in, and it's not too hard to get back. I got back to some of these um, with the star. I got back with um, Pinto, back to Poe. I got back to A Christmas Carol with uh, the Matthew's favorite saying about the country right or wrong. I think in, in The Christmas Carol, it's, it, it reads, or the country's done for. You can go back and look up that. They're all little hints that uh, this is the same author who had the same proclivities and the same favorite little um, colloquialisms, you know. And the whole study is not made up of these little tiny dots that I'm connecting. The study includes some very, very major clues, some real smoking guns here and there as brighter spots in the tapestry. But the way you know this is a real tapestry, that Matthew really did write all these 2,300 pieces, is that you can 
continually run across these little connecting threads throughout this entire tapestry. And I can randomly dip into this thing and find them, you know. So uh, that's all for today. I don't know how long this is. It's way too long, no doubt. And, uh, oh my gosh, an hour and 21 minutes. Nobody will sit through all this, but maybe somebody will kind of, this is the kind of thing that you could poke through and randomly access, you know. So feel free to do that. And uh, I will see you next time.